So how's it going with the Japanese? It ain't the Japanese. It's the malarial mosquitoes. What do you mean? Like it ain't the heat. It's the humidity. Man, somebody's been fighting in the jungle way too long. Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah. May 16th, 1942. Germany has not launched a large offensive on the Eastern Front since 1941, but they had plans in the South next week. But you know what happens this week? This week, the Soviets jump the gun. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. The big news last week was the Battle of the Coral Sea, the first engagement in history between enemy aircraft carriers. Japan lost a light carrier and the U.S. a carrier over the course of the battle, and each side had another that took damage. But while this was maybe a tactical victory for the Japanese, it was a strategic one for the Allies because the Japanese were forced to call off or postpone their offensive to take Port Moresby. Japanese high command wasn't going to sit around and gather dust, though, because they issued the order to attack Midway and the Aleutian Islands in early June. The British attacked the Vichy French on Madagascar, taking the main port, and the Americans finally surrendered to the Japanese on the Philippines. The Germans began an offensive in the Crimea, and two Allied retreats were in progress from Burma to India. Bill Slim, Burma Corps commander, has spent the last five days bringing his troops and refugees across the Chindwin River while the Nepalese Gurkhas fight off the Japanese vanguard. On May 10th, when the enemy broke through, the final shots were exchanged as the Gurkhas withdrew into the jungle along the Kalewa River Gorge. Escape now carried the exhausted army on a 90-mile trek up the steamy Kabul Valley as the first monsoon rains began. The ground turned into mud, and the malarial mosquitoes became a plague to the quinine-starved soldiers in what they named the Valley of Death. Today, on the 16th, they finally began arriving in Tamu in the Assam province of India. This is the longest retreat in British military history, over 1,500 kilometers, and over 12,000 soldiers reach India. Another 13,000 soldiers, Burmese, British, Indian, Nepalese, lost their lives fighting off the enemy during the retreat. As for refugees, the numbers are unclear, but of perhaps 400,000 total, mainly Indian, as many as a quarter of them die en route. In a few days, on the 20th, when he gives up his command, General Harold Alexander, now in charge of all British forces in Burma, will state, of course we shall take Burma back. It is part of the British Empire. American Joe Stilwell is also marching out of Burma with his little crew. On the 13th, after days of marching through elephant trails in the jungle, Stilwell crosses the Chindwin. He is just 36 hours ahead of the Japanese. By the end of the 14th, they cover the final 80 kilometers in the mountains and they reach Assam. They will make it to Imphal the 20th without losing a man. For all of the fame that he gets from this exploit, he himself is under no illusions about what happened in Burma. He'd hoped to lead 100,000 Chinese troops to safety. Maybe 10,000 of them will make it to India in the end. Japanese losses total are below 8,000. Stillwell will tell reporters in New Delhi, I got a hell of a beating. We got out of Burma and it was humiliating as hell. I think we ought to find out what caused it and go back and retake it. Chiang Kai-shek will interpret it as Stillwell leading two Chinese armies into Burma and leaving with two squadrons. Chiang also had insisted that any withdrawal be to China, and Stillwell had asked Washington and not China whether he should make for China or India. But as they are leaving Burma, on the 10th, elements of the Thai Fayap army cross into Burma. Infantry and cavalry units armored recon, and air force units, and they engage the retreating Chinese 93rd Army. Keng Tung is the main objective, for the Thai and the Japanese have agreed that the Shan states and Karen state will be under Thai control. Japan is planning on extending its sphere of control far to the east, though. But on the 14th, the first indications of Japan's coming attack on Midway reach Allied codebreakers. See, Isoroku Yamamoto's combined fleet plans a huge operation to take Midway and the Aleutian Islands in early June. In fact, the Alaska and Midway operations will require the Japanese to send out, and importantly, supply, 
eight carriers, 11 battleships, 22 cruisers, 65 destroyers, 21 submarines, and some 700 planes. Yamamoto will direct operations from his flagship, the battleship Yamato, for the first time in the war, and his fleet will try to complete the task begun at Pearl Harbor, the destruction of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The enormous radio communications necessary to direct such an offensive have not escaped the U.S. Navy's communications analysts. For nearly three months now, they've been aware that the Japanese might try to extend their defensive perimeter beyond Wake and the Marshall Islands. On March 11th, both Joe Rochefort, commander of the Hypo Intelligence Center on Hawaii, and Edwin Layton, intelligence director for the U.S. Pacific Fleet, said the big threat to the fleet would be a buildup of Japanese land-based planes on the Marshalls and the Mandates. Well, all during March and April, the Japanese moved planes to the Marshalls and the Mandates. Through analysis of communications activity and exploitation of intercepted messages, Navy communications analysts detected and reported daily the Japanese activities, frequently warning that the Japanese were planning an attack on Midway. These warnings were not universally accepted. By this week on the 14th, Admiral Ernest King, America's chief naval officer and commander of the U.S. fleet, thinks there are four possible enemy actions under preparation. One, an attack on the Midway Oahu Line the first week in June. Two, a simultaneous attack on the Aleutians. Three, an attack to occupy Nauru about May 17th. Four, to reinforce New Britain, New Guinea, and strike southeast any time between May 25th and June 15th. By May 16th, both Admiral Nimitz and Admiral King were in almost total agreement concerning Japanese intentions towards Midway and the Aleutians. Chester Nimitz commands the Pacific Fleet. King directs Nimitz to declare a state of fleet-opposed invasion for the Aleutian and Hawaiian Islands, including Midway, which Nimitz does, which gives Nimitz complete control of all military forces in the Hawaiian Islands. The Army commander there, General Emmons, will soon challenge the decision to defend Midway and not Oahu, and Washington, D.C. analysts believe Japan will attack Australia, New Caledonia, and Fiji between June 15th and 20th. Nimitz writes to Washington that he believes the main Japanese striking force is to be against Midway, but the timing is uncertain. He also states that unless the enemy is using radio deception on a grand scale, we have a fairly good idea of his intentions. I'll talk a bit more about things next week, but that is where we stand at the moment. One island that is very much under attack this week, well, like basically every week, is Malta. Now, the British landed 61 Spitfires at the end of last week to defend the island. HMS Welshman arrives the 10th in the middle of the aerial battle that day with the Axis and unloads 100 spare plane engines and trained ground crews for Spitfires. The British have, it seems, learned from their mistakes, and the new Spitfires are not immediately destroyed on the ground like previous deliveries. They are prepared this time to get the planes airborne before they can become targets. They are dispersed on arrival into protected areas, fueled and armed in as little as six minutes, and airborne with fresh pilots, fresh experienced pilots, when the raid comes expecting to destroy them. The Axis lose 47 planes versus only three British. And this is the sudden end of daytime Axis bombing raids on Malta, which might help turn the tide in the Mediterranean in favor of the Allies. Luftwaffe boss smiling Albert Kesselring is unaware of the actions of the 10th, though, and tells Adolf Hitler that same day that Malta is neutralized. Hitler has a few other things on his mind this week, though, for on the 12th, the Soviet Red Army launches an offensive against the Germans in Ukraine. On the morning of May 12th, preceded by an hour of artillery and air bombardment, Timoshenko's northern and southern prongs jabbed into Paulus's 6th Army, which for three days and nights rocked and lurched in a highly dangerous situation as waves of Soviet riflemen and slabs of Soviet armor crashed down on it. In response to this, Hitler sends Flieger Corps 8 under Wolfram von Richthofen to support the ground troops. By the end of the day on the 14th, the Germans have small but growing aerial superiority. 
Ewald von Kleist, commanding the 1st Panzer Army opposite the Soviet left flank, is ordered to ready and launch a quick counteroffensive. That evening is the time when Timoshenko is to send his armor and other mobile units right through the 6th Army. And his armies have made some impressive advances, but he holds back, partly because he thinks he'll get an even better opportunity soon, and partly because faulty intelligence reports strong German armor opposition. This whole offensive, though, compromises Operation Friedrichus, an Axis counteroffensive aiming to break the Izium pocket that's been planned for a couple of weeks by anticipating Army Group South Commander Fedor von Bock's moves by a few days and attacking first. Bock panics and warns Hitler that they'll have to defend Kharkov instead of launching Friedrichus. Hitler calls this a minor blemish, to which Bock responds, This is no blemish. It's a matter of life and death. This does not deter Hitler, who moves the launch date for Friedrichus one day back. He may be correct. Airstrikes on the 15th stop the Soviet assault, and on the 16th, further Soviet attacks go pretty much nowhere, partly because of lack of heavy artillery. Bach does change the general plan for Friedrichus so that one attack prong is now to go to the south of the Izium Bulge, and Kleist is to hit Timoshenko's flank. Those attacks are to kick off at dawn tomorrow. As for the continuing fighting down on the Kerch Peninsula, on the 10th, the Soviet 51st Army is trapped between the German 22nd Panzer Division and the Sea of Azov. That day and the next, the planes of Flieger Corps 8 are on a rampage, destroying Soviet planes and armor. On the 11th, the 51st surrenders. On the 12th, the Luftwaffe sends 1,500 sorties against the other Soviet forces, and Kerch itself burning most of it to the ground. After that, however, Richthofen is ordered to send his units to support the German forces facing the Soviet attacks at Kharkov, as I said a minute ago. But this battle, which technically ends three days from now, is really over. The remnants of Kerch fall the 15th. However, some 80,000 Soviets do manage to escape the Germans, evacuated by the Red Navy. So they live to fight another day, even though well over 100,000 are captured. Numbers are tricky, but Soviet forces killed number 28,000 or more, while German total casualties are 7,588 men killed, wounded, or missing. Lev Mechlis, whose lack of competence we've heard several reports about, bears a lot of the blame for this disaster. And from his post on high, he is brought low, losing his position as Deputy Defense Commissar. Kozlov, the Crimean Front Chief of Staff, is also dismissed. And here are some notes to end the week. On the 12th, U-553 sinks British freighter Nicoya in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, starting the Battle of St. Lawrence. Dutch freighter Leto is sunk a few hours later. Before this, a minesweeper, a couple of motor launches, and a yacht have been the guard for the river and gulf. But after this, five flower-class corvettes are deployed. Well, we'll see how this all goes. This looks to be a long situation and series of actions. On the 12th, in Germany, the America Bomber proposal that I spoke about the other week reaches Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering. On the 15th in the States, the bill creating the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps becomes law. FDR sets a recruitment goal of 25,000 women for the first year. But Secretary of War Henry Stimson will authorize an increase to 150,000 volunteers. These uniformed women will work in the Army as mechanics, switchboard operators, and bakers at first, but their duties will expand to things like drivers and stenographers over time. And this week of the war comes to its end. A week that sees a preemptive Soviet offensive, an important Allied victory in the skies over Malta, naval action in Canada, armies entering and exiting Burma, and Allied intelligence trying to guess where the Japanese will strike next. Well, we know that they're going to hit Midway and the Aleutian Islands. Two general targets. And that's interesting because it goes against Clausewitz, and trust me, the Japanese have read their Clausewitz. Two basic principles underlie all strategic planning, right? The first is to move with maximum concentration, meaning trace the source of the enemy's strength to as few sources as possible and compress your attack 
on those to as few actions as possible. So your first job in war is to identify the enemy's center of gravity. Your second is to be certain your forces are concentrated against it for your attack. Concentration of force. He even comes out and says it. There is no higher and simpler law of strategy than that of keeping one's forces concentrated. But that is not what the Japanese have planned. But maybe they have so much force that in the end it doesn't matter, right? Maybe that. Maybe. Holding Malta is the key for the British to taking Libya. If you want to see how the Axis colonized Libya in the first place, you can click right here for our Between Two Wars Season 1 episode about the Italian adventures there. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Dennis Conley. Be like Dennis and join the army and make me happy. Yep, brings a smile to my face. See, look at it. Just like that. So do that. And don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you next time. (laughs) 